Anyone have any victories for this week that they want to share? Any anything about buyers or sellers they need help with? Anyone want to go first? I'll go first. My uh, I have a client from Colorado who we've been trying to close this deal for probably just a little over a month now, but he's an older gentleman and he could not figure out how to wire his funds for closing. <laughs> and so he figured it out last night. So oh, well, that was good. It's good to close. Uh, that's, that's my uh, thing that I'm grateful for. So does anyone else have anything they want to share? I'm it's not snowing today. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Great, not just little things. Yeah, yeah. one day at a time. For sure. Oh, for sure. Cool. Does anyone need? It? Does anyone have any buyers or sellers they have questions about? They want to help with. Mm -hmm. Too many. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> the next one. Mm -hmm. Taking people off to the snow stuff. Okay. Broker, so broker moment is, and this is just not includes ourselves, but um, what do you have, what is the document you have to use when you yourself are purchasing a property as a license or selling property as a licensed agent? Yes, now. Just disclosure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> One thing I will also point out is when else do you need to use this? When you're related to the client. Yes. I've worked, I've worked with a lot of, of agents who don't know that and will start going through the process and they'll be like, oh yeah, this is my grandma's house. Yep. You can't, you got to disclose, guys. You have to disclose. and. Even even if so, even you have to disclose, even if you don't put it on the MLS, if it's your own property, because that is your duty as a licensed agent to disclose it. Just so you guys are aware. But if your last name happens to be Jones, doesn't mean you're married that uh, you're related to <laughs> every Jones. Yes. Very true. Yeah. <laughs> okay, my last name's Peterson, so. Pretty similar. And then this upcoming week, again, we have five hours of CE, which is exciting. I think, uh, who takes advantage of the CE class? Just curious. It's way worth it being one who, so I've been in the business for nine years. And for the last nine years, I wait till I have to renew my license in the week before. I buy all my classes and take them for a whole week so I can renew my license. <laughs> this, I know, this, exactly. And that's why I'm here. That's awesome. I just, I just procrastinated. <laughs> but so take advantage of it. So you don't have to do that. Because it was for me, it was like, Four or five hundred bucks every single time. So then congratulations to everyone who's closing business. It's really good. Okay, again, who signed up for this? Has anyone signed up for the ninja selling class? Then just to give them the feedback. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. My testimony that I've actually gone and paid twice. I would honestly consider going a third time. Like the single best class that you will ever take. It's really hard. The first time I went, I like didn't want to put my business aside. And so I was like leaving five minutes earlier, doing all this stuff. And I went the second time and like cleared my whole like it was literally the exact same class and I felt like I was better agent leaving the second time. I still do things every single day from this class, like a hundred percent. 
Operating. There's literally not a better class that I've ever been to. The hardest thing is setting aside the time, but it's so worth it. Yeah. Good. You know, that was my second time too this last year. And I love that. And I still do my morning routines just exactly from that course. I have my, my note cards I'm sending out every day. It's such a good course, especially working on SOI. We were talking about it on the way here versus cold leads and stuff. It's exactly how you want to be able to treat your people is what you learn on NJ. So do it. So again, I, my question is for everyone who feels like you are a leader in this industry. Who educates yourself as often as possible to continue to be a leader? This is how you do it. It's one of these classes right here. Because you got to be able to implement something, show that it's successful, and then share it with others. Right? That's the only way you can lead. You can't just read the cliff notes and then become a leader. So I would recommend signing up for it. I have taken, they, I did like a little online course with them a couple of years ago, but I will be also taking this course this time. Um, it's way worth it. So these are moments. So anyone that hasn't taken it yet, come into our sales meeting and have, have the girl Clara that teaches it come and give you just a taste of what it's like, so that you can see. I just found with that one. Uh, we don't have it quite yet on the schedule, but it'll be, be in the next thirty days. We'll let you know. Watch the music page. We'll email you. But this is the the uh, early bird price. If you don't register before June 1st, no, sorry, May 15th, it's 950. I spent 1350 going to Colorado to see it. I would do it all over again, over and over and over again. Events coordinator's not here. <laughs> so we went over this last week. I'm gonna go off of memory. So this the the gardening event, I'm 100 percent certain is happening here. Yes, here. So it'll be happening here. I do know for the rodeo, though, they need to know as soon as possible who's coming and they're paying for it. Such there. They'll pay for your ticket, but every additional ticket is $12. So if you want to bring a plus one to the rodeo night, just make sure that you let them know, but it will be 12 bucks. And then Strawberry Days, which is a part of the rodeo, if I remember correctly, like every year we go and we do the, the strawberry. volunteer cutting of the strawberries and help them out. So that's fun if you want to volunteer this year. And if I remember correctly, we're doing the 16th, not the 17th. One of these is wrong. So we got to figure out. She let me know because one, one is says the 17th, the one says the 16th. Yeah. I think last week she said the 16th, where it's not actually, we're going fr to Friday's portion of everything, not Saturday's portion. Oh, so get that all out as well then. Thank you. And we are doing this gallery sugar hunt on the 13th. Provo? Provo for a trip around the city. Probably. There'll be two teams. Cool. Is Ibex here? You're up. Sweet, sweet. <laughs> okay. I'm Tanner with Elevate Home Warranty. Oh, home descriptions. Sorry, you guys all know me. Um, at Elevate Home Warranty, um, we believe that there's two important things as a real estate agent that you guys um, need to sell, or to sell real estate. One of those is to have a good reputation, and one, the other one is a good headshot. We can help with one of those, your reputation. If you're, if you're ugly, you're ugly, man. So we can help with your headshot. We can help with your reputation. I mean, there's one really cool thing that we're doing to help with reputation as real estate agents. Um, home warranty companies in general, we think traditional home warranty companies are actually broken. Um, we're doing some really cool things at Elevate to help with this. And one of those is actually technology. We have at Elevate a homeowner app. Um, and one of the issues that home warranty companies have is, is decreasing their cycle time. So from when the client requests service on their home for a home warranty and the time that it actually gets fixed. So on that homeowner app, your clients can actually choose three preferred time slots that they want the contractor to come out. Um, the contractor selects automatically one of those times and everyone is notified through the whole process. The communication is perfect. Um, and it's honestly something that has helped just eliminate a lot of that confusion through the home warranty process. And we've actually decreased our cycle time um, by a ton. We actually have the fastest service in Utah. So that's huge for you and your clients. And the home warranty gets done on your client's time, not on our time, because we think that's how it should be. So if you have any questions about the tech, um, some of the really cool things that we're doing at Elevate, just reach out to me. I'd love to sit down and chat about it. Awesome. Dave, start covering sewer. 
Um, yes, actually. So we do some pump, we do sewer. Um, we also have added some on demand maintenance items too. So we're trying to be very different than everyone else. Good for you. So awesome. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And OBO. Yeah, I. Uh, first colony. So I know first colony right now, they're they're taking a mandatory class on it's a uh, first construction one time close one time close that's what it was and then they will be teaching a class on that they said in the upcoming weeks uh security national yes here by zoom oh. <laughs> go for it security national just real quick we've been talking about the llpas a lot in the last few weeks i just wanted to explain them really quick loan level pricing adjustments for conventional loans are risk-based pricing adjustments that vary based on credit score, loan to value ratio, type of product, debt to income, and various other factors. And they're charged to first-time home buyers in fees and points. These are being waived by um, Fannie Mae Conventional starting in August. However, Security National and myself are doing them manually now, which will help you quite a bit with um, rate for your first-time home buyer. So please reach out with any questions at all, and I'd love to help you. Thanks. But since Obio is not here, I'll give them a plug. Um, I don't do a lot of listings. I do mostly property management, but I happen to have two listings right now. And I decided I'd sign on to Obio, and it was easy. It was a breeze. They got the photographers out. They put my signs out. They put my lockbox out. And anytime I needed something changed, they were really responsive to that. They create a, a website for your listing. They create a flyer for your listing that you can share because I've always had difficulty sharing to social media and it was just super easy. I don't know why I haven't done them before. Right? One stop shop. We love them. It was great right partner. Yeah, though. it was really great. We think they're awesome. What are their fees? They are as little as it's like a 150 for a photography package of about 20, and then you can have additional depending on what type of home, right. luxury homes, you could get yeah. more, it's you know, aerial and everything. It was like $20 to place and remove the sign and $10 to place and remove the wow, that's right? Way, way reasonable, yeah, okay. very reasonable. So licensed and they do the lockbox and stuff, and yeah, and themselves and everything. Exactly. You have to be licensed. You can get um, go through the class and get the key. Mm -hmm. You can be an affiliate and um, get uh, access to the key box. Because mm -hmm. yeah, there are affiliates and so they have access to the to the super box. So it was great. Sweet. That's hundred awesome. dollars. Uh, yeah, it was it was it was like one hundred ninety six dollars for each. And even if it didn't sell and the owner takes it off the market. To me, it's just a marketing cost. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was really reasonable. Yeah. So I did call and just price just this last week with Grant. Um, and there's they, they also do the 3D tours, mm -hmm. the Matterports. They'll do the drone pictures. Virtual staging. Mm -hmm. All that Cover stuff. All. It comes up to about more like 400. But that's oh, a huge package. If you need to put a luxury home, that would be nothing. Yeah, for like the first one, I think they give you fifty dollars off the whole package. Yeah, so it was. I pay seventy five bucks for my sign and post guy. Just See? and that's to go once. That's not going back. It, so, but this install sign. Just so you log in, just install sign, key box, whatever. Just click button from the RD room. Early this way. Uh, acclaimed. Silverback, two man movers. Cool. What oh, sorry. What side? I love coming to Presidio. I haven't seen you guys in a while, so I'm super happy to be here. I am Cassandra Aubrey. I'm the online sales agent with Woodside. So anytime you have any customers looking for a new build or maybe someone picky, give me a call and we'll get them their perfect home. So right now we have single family homes. We have a few communities in American Fork. And then we are adding a townhome community in American Fork later this year as well. Um, you know the price point? For the townhomes? Not yet. Not yet. I don't want to say anything. Yeah. Um, but if you have someone that might be interested, I can add you to my interest list. So I'll email you as soon as I have like dates, pricing, floor plan layouts, everything like that. 
Um, and our deals right now are pretty amazing. So if your client uses a preferred lender, you will or they'll get 3% of the purchase price to use towards either closing costs or rate buy down. And then on top of that, they'll get, depending on the community, up to $30,000 towards um, upgrade options as well. So yeah, we've got some really great stuff going on. Um, that's my contact on the gum and on that paper. So let me know how I can help you out. What companies are your perfect letters? So we use guaranteed rate, citywide home loans, and Cardinal Financial. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Does anyone have any other questions before we jump in with Craig? Oh, it's EG. Yeah, it's spelled great. It's EG. But now, yeah. Sorry, Craig. Welcome, Craig Wagner. Going to keep us out of prison. So that's what we're going to do. Right. We hit and stop. Awesome. This is about the 20th uh, brokers training that I've done since February. And so it's always neat to see the, the meetings and how they, they're structured. I love the emphasis on education. As an educator, I, I think that's one of the greatest ways that you can differentiate yourself um, from the other real estate agents out there. So. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for um, giving me this, this platform. So this is gonna be pretty uh, casual uh, as far as our, our discussion. I did uh, kind of set it as a Q&A. So if you have any sort of questions that are pressing that we can have discussions, I certainly have things that I can talk about based on my experience on the legal hotline. Um, maybe I should take a step back and introduce myself. Uh, let's, let's do that first. Um, I'm Craig Wagner. I'm legal counsel for the Utah Association of Realtors. So I've been with the UAR for almost 11 years now. So it's not a hyperbole. Literally, I've answered hundreds of thousands of questions from fellow realtors. And so um, I can kind of gauge how the market is going just by the types of questions that I'm answering. When I first started, it was short sales and third party approvals. Um, you know, and then there were multiple offers. And now we're somewhere in between where I did a broker's training just last week and they were asking me about short sales because there were, there were three that they were, that they were dealing with. Um, and they were from properties that were bought in 2021. So you can kind of see, you know, trouble. they were already in trouble. They were at their end and then they probably lost their job and now they're underwater. And so, but I, in that same meeting, we had discussions about multiple offers. And so it was kind of a weird scenario. So, you know, that's what I'm kind of seeing, just a little balance there. So I want to be as, as helpful to you as possible. So is there are there any pressing questions that maybe you guys have had that you want me to address or any topics that you would like me to address? Yeah. I, um, I've had a lot of discussions with other realtors lately, especially about how is it not steering for builders to say if you use our preferred lender, our preferred warranty company, our preferred title company, we're going to get incentivize you to do that? Sure. How is that not steering? It's it's not easy. I mean, certainly it's incentivizing for sure. Um, and can it? It's not illegal steering. I guess that's probably the better way to say it. Um, builders would have a vested interest in vetting certain vendors that they use. I mean, they're, they're, they're taking all the risks. So it makes sense why they would have a preferred lender. What they can't do is penalize you for not using those. In essence saying, hey, if you don't use this person, here's a penalty for that. But now, they do. I know that I know that what you're saying is, well, then I don't get the incentive. I, I understand kind of the, the inverse of that. But, but at least right now, the CFPB has said you can offer incentives. You just can't offer penalties which I know is kind of a backwards way of saying it, but they can offer those. But if you have a relationship like our friends who are looking to purchase a home with a builder in sure. Mountain, and I already I let the builder's agent know, like my husband has already done a pre-call. Yes, but they have to do a pre-call through us. Sure. And then they decide, and like, okay, we already have an established relationship, but anyway, it's, it gets a little... You've got to navigate that. 
They can require you to get pre-qualified with their preferred lender. And you'll notice that the UAR new construction rep seat does say that. And I would imagine most builder contracts have some language, just again, because of the risk mitigation factor. They're the ones taking all the risk and they want to make sure that, that you can't actually finance it. Yeah. Look at it from this perspective. Can a seller, forget new, new construction, could a seller say, hey, before I consider your offer, I want you a buyer to be pre-approved by my lender. You know different. Think of it, think of it as a seller, because a seller isn't the builder in case, okay, so and they want to, they may be trying to push their their preferred lender as well, but at the same time, they're also trying to determine how qualified this buyer may be. So a seller can hear something very similar to this. Sure. And Craig, if I'm wrong, please correct me. Sure. <laughs> Say a seller, can you mandate a particular title company to use? No. Okay. As a seller? Well, a buyer has the option of choosing, but a seller could say, I'm not going to accept your offer unless you use X title company. Yeah, and and in especially if it's not going to be a split settlement, but as you know, if the seller is paying for the title insurance policy, they can right. choose. Exactly. But uh, sorry, you you said incentivize it and penalty. Is it a penalty if they say if you don't use our title company, we will not pay for your title? Mm -hmm. Um, not legally, but that yes, but no. If if they said the purchase price, you know, we'll charge you an additional five grand or something like that. That could be seen as a penalty. Um, you don't see a ton of these types of RESPA violations because really that's what it hinges on. Is it a RESPA violation? Is it illegal steering? Um, they've just kind of classified uh, incentives are permissible, penalties are not. But you're right that that line can be grayed pretty pretty easily. Hey. Penalty when you have to put like double the deposits down or like your sure. I mean, because like that's the very thing for me saying if you don't choose to use their preferred lender, then you owe double the deposit. Sure. Like that's like a huge risk for your time. That, that seems like it could be a penalty. Um, you know, the incentives would be, hey, you get five thousand dollars in upgrades. That would be an incentive, right? Um, you could obviously see it in the inverse. Well, if if I don't do it, then I, I'm penalized because I don't get the upgrades. But they've at least the CFPB has said no, that's not an illegal incentive. Um, it's not illegal steering, but it's a fine line. You're right. You're you're kind of seeing that now. I am hearing, and you guys would know better than I I would, um, that that because of the market and kind of what we're in, builders are willing to to negotiate. So you may have more sway. When it comes to negotiating than you have in the past couple of years. Are your clients upset? They have to double pre-qualify. Uh, I never have. I think you're upset. But I was reading the like, contract from I had the builder's agent send me the contract. Sure. And there's multiple, there, there's one that deals specifically with home warranty and title. But in the contract, it actually says if you choose to split the closing. Then you're responsible for all of the fees mm -hmm. involved with that. And I was like, oh, is that? <laughs> sure. Okay. I don't, anyway. Sure. Yeah. It would be freedom of choice uh, when it comes to choosing, but you're right. If the seller is paying for the title insurance company, then they can pick the title company and, and they're offering that as, as a benefit. Yeah. Is in this, I don't know. So in the rep seat, because the contract says that the seller will pay for the policy. Sure. This is a builder's contract. Where sure. They have a separate contract. So it's, there isn't anything in, in, I mean, that I'm aware of in the rest of the rules that says the seller is obligated to pay for the policy. So it's, right. they're just, that's where I, I think that's the difference. If you were to look, if it, maybe a rep seat was being offered sure. in that situation and they came back and said, if you don't use the preferred lender, then that might fall under that category of, of yeah. penalty. But if it's the builder's own contract where they don't have it as a penalty, it's just saying. Sure. Well, even, even under the REPC, under section 6.2, where it talks about the title insurance policy, that could be modified. I mean, we have a default provision that the seller is responsible, but if the two parties wanted to modify that sure. and the buyer is responsible, great. Or if the two parties, which, you know, I've heard of instances where it's kind of a family property and they don't want title insurance, great, they could remove that. I was just thinking on the penalty 
yeah. issue is that by removing that, parties agreed to do it because the seller was saying, hey, I'll accept your offer if I don't buy this. Yeah. Is that a pen considered a penalty even though they agree? I think I think there's there's quite a bit of latitude, at least the way that I've seen it, as far as from an enforcement standpoint. Okay, these are these are really good. And so this is kind of how a hotline day goes. I, I get one question on, on something, and then it just kind of goes on different tangential things. Um, any other kind of pressing questions? I can kind of give you a hotline before. Is this uh, just a free service? Yeah, well, it's it's part of your benefit with the with the board. So by virtue of your membership with the Salt Lake Board and the Utah Association of Realtors, you have access to me um, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from eight thirty to four. So is it free? Oh, no, it's part of your dues. Yeah, it's part of your dues. It's free. <laughs> it's That's why I can't say that's free. For it. Yeah. Paying for it. But you're not you. And I go to him. <laughs> and my and so my number is 801-676-5211. And you can leave a message 24-7. I mean, today's a hotline day and there's already seven questions, you know, you know, phone calls waiting for me. So you know, use it. Um, but yeah, I would encourage you to go to within your brokers, talk to your brokers, and then and then decide from there. Um they may say, hey, call the hotline. And that, that's pretty pretty cool. What was the number again? 801-676-5211. And who's Lance? Lance is the other attorney. Who is Lance? <laughs> it's a deep question, yeah. Um, <laughs> what is Lance? Yeah, um, Lance, he... Uh, he yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's recorded, yeah. yeah. Um, no, yeah, Lance, we have had instances where people disagree with my opinion. And they'll call the next day to try to get the other attorneys to get a different answer. They do this. Lance is on Fridays, typically. I'm typically Monday and Wednesday, but we, we cover for one another. Um, and we're only a couple of doors down. So if you do try to do that, we talk to one another. So it's not like you're pulling a fast one over one of us. And they don't like my answer. They call the people. Yeah, and, yeah, and somehow they give a little bit more information that changes the answer. And it, it, I've had that. Wait, they didn't say there was a buyer broker. Yeah, that's a big thing. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, we want to be as helpful as possible. Um, I'll talk to some of the calls that I'm I'm getting, uh, and they're probably the same questions that you have within your brokerage. Um, sellers disclosures. You guys probably always get different questions about seller's disclosures. I get at least one meth question every hotline period, okay? Whether or not a property stigmatized, when does someone have to disclose, what if it's been remediated, something along those lines. Um, what happens if a seller fails to disclose something material? What is material information? How long does a buyer have to go after a seller for something that wasn't disclosed? What do you think? Is it still five years? Is it five years? It, here's the statute of limitations. It's three years from when you discover the undisclosed information. So it could be five years. It could be 10 years. It could be 15 years from now. And I just had a call on Monday where it was 10 years after the buyers bought the property and they've now discovered something that they believe the sellers knew about but failed to disclose. A decade later? A decade later. So, so for me, and this is, I, I, you probably think I'm already on my soapbox. For me, I err on the side of over-disclosure than under-disclosure. Because look, if a, buy, if a buyer can come back after the seller 10 years later, potentially, I don't want to have to deal with that. I don't want to, as a broker, to have to deal with any of those types of things. And so I would err on the side of, of disclosure. Yeah. So it's K-R-E-G. K-R-E-G, yep. Wagner, W-A-G-N-E-R. So do you have to prove the seller's new? Yes. Yeah, so that would be the, that's the most difficult element for a buyer to prove is actual knowledge by the seller. Now, oftentimes they, they're able to, to, to prove that by either an admission by the seller. They'll say it off the cuff. Oh yeah, I had that issue. I didn't think it was a big deal. Or the neighbors. I mean, just today I had a call. 
Just today I had a call where a buyer was, you know, their, their basement had flooded. They thought it was just because of the snow. The neighbor came over and said, oh yeah, the seller had the same issue five weeks ago. And then they reviewed the seller's disclosures. Guess what? Seller's disclosures are silent on that. Disclose, 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 because your neighbors will after well, they will and they want to be in the sport. So that would be a, a way. And you're right, the longer you go, the more the more difficult it is to, to prove that actual knowledge. Um, and it all falls under the umbrella that the buyer could not discover the information on their own, acting as an ordinary prudent buyer. Yeah. So what's the consequence of not disclosing? Because when we bought our home, we didn't the seller didn't disclose to us that sure. the pipes would freeze in the winter okay. um, in one of the bathrooms. But when we bought the home, we closed, there was a note for us. <laughs> pipes freeze in the winter. Sure. Um, <laughs> it's nice. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. It was in like a nice. I'll be like your new home. Thing. Pipes freeze. Yeah. And in with other stuff. Anyhow, I called them and they said, well, we would like you to fix that. And they said, no way, we're closed, we're done. So I asked my broker at the time, and he was like, you would just have to go to court, which just seems like a huge waste of time. So is there not any other consequence besides that you just have to push it and go to court? Yeah, no, it's a fair question. And it's my answer is not super satisfactory. The, this sounds flippant. It's not meant to sound flippant. The contract's only as good as both parties honor it. Now, you'll notice that the Repsy has provisions available to a party that isn't the defaulting party. But the only way to enforce that, if the other side just won't help with it, is, is through litigation. Now, one of the provisions in the Repsy that does give it some significant teeth is Section 17. That talks about attorney's fees and court costs being awarded to the prevailing party. That's actually meant to deter litigation, not encourage it, but that would be the mechanism, if you have to go through those hoops, which I admit, as an attorney, that's not a fun process to go through, but that would be the only way that I know that you could force the seller to come to the table. Um, and then if you kind of weigh the cost benefit analysis and say, man, the cost and, and the benefit, they just don't meet, then a lot of people just say, look, we're just gonna fix it ourselves. Yeah, and then, yeah. One thing just for everybody in the room that's really helpful um, is with your home warranty company, if you actually get listing coverage on the property and then the buyers get the same buyer's coverage, whether it's elevated with anybody um, with a, whatever home warranty company, it actually covers your, your butt a little bit on some of that kind of stuff. Just because if you can show you have a home warranty with the listing side of it, and then it moves transfers over to the buyer side of it, we can kind of cover some of those pretty existing things that maybe happen during that time. So it kind of covers your sellers as well. So that's one really cool thing that any home warranty that offers sellers coverage will be able to. So. Yeah, and I and I would imagine maybe I'll shift gears a little bit, but stay on the kind of the seller disclosure theme. I would imagine you guys are pretty careful in helping your sellers um, meet their contractual obligations, right? And all of the contractual obligations are found in section seven for residential and it's seven A through L. There are a number of things that need to be brought there, right? You have the UAR form that helps meet the contractual obligation under section seven A, but what about B through L? There are other things that need to be disclosed by a set deadline. HOA minutes, are those easy to get in, in some instances? You know, sometimes they're hard, right? Commitment for title insurance. Okay. I I my heart would drop when people would say, yeah, our seller disclosure deadline's two days after acceptance, but we still need to get the commitment for title insurance. Okay, well, you better work with your title, title company to get that right now, because I've had some that say they may need a little longer than, than just two days warning. You know, I hope not. HOA minutes, CCRs. Yeah. That will take more time than even the title report, usually. And I know what a buyer's doing. They're writing that offer with a short seller disclosure deadline to say, hey, I'm serious. I'm really interested in the property. But just know on the seller side that that short window of time, you better have everything in line because it's a breach of contract if you don't provide the disclosures by that deadline. When you read section seven in conjunction with section 21, which is the time is of the essence clause, I have heard of instances where buyers back out 
not because of due diligence, not because of financing or appraisal, but because sellers failed to disclose by the set deadline. And they've, you know, you can understand where that's a difference of what happens with the penalties. Buyer would get their earnest money back and they could then ask the seller for a sum equal to the earnest money. Again, my heart dropped, you know, over the past couple of years where I heard earnest money amounts of $500,000, over a million dollars was the largest one that I heard. And, and oftentimes we think as a seller, hey, that's a protection for the, for the seller. That's to ensure that the buyer performs. Yes, that's true, but it also ensures that the seller will perform. And if a seller misses the HOA minutes with that $1 million uh, earnest money deposit, they could potentially be on the hook for a sum equal to the earnest money. As a seller, I don't, I'm glad that we're going away from like the 250 or $500 earnest money amounts. I don't want to go back there, but I, I do think a seller should understand the ramifications of taking a very large earnest money amount. Does that make sense? Because it there's equal responsibility on both sides. The person who owns, let me just dealt with it because they were to sell by owner, so you didn't have like their broker to go to to try around. Sure. We didn't want to take in the court. So we could have, but we didn't want to. And it's a fair point. Oftentimes buyers will come to you and say, hey, I'm having this issue. I think that the sellers failed to disclose. What are my options? And, and again, this isn't super satisfactory. Your involvement is going to be fairly limited. You want to be helpful. You want to be accommodating, but advocating on their behalf, acting as their de facto attorney, that's, that's going to expose your brokers to additional liability. So really, you're going to want to say, look, this is a buyer-seller issue. It starts to exceed the scope of my licensure. Maybe you guys already have some referrals of attorneys that you can refer them to. Maybe you're willing to reach out to the other broker. Fine, I don't have any heartburn with that. But just know the longer you kind of involve yourself after the transaction, there is increased uh, risk of liability there. Yeah. With that being said, I got a call two days ago um, from a neighbor of a home that I sold in the fall. And she's, this home is still vacant because it's looking at being developed. The person that bought it is maybe going to develop it or maybe going to get tenants or whatever. Um, anyhow, the neighbor said that they saw people stealing stuff out of the shed. Oh. Home. So she called me to tell me, even though the home sold, I represented the seller. So I called the buyer's agent, but I was actually wondering that, like, how much do you want to get involved in something like that? Well, I should call the police. That's <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, she fired. That's why she called me. Right. That was nice. I knew the liar agent. I would have well, that's a fair point. That was nice. It's a fair point. I mean, it, it just goes to show that you as a realtor, I mean, it's more than just helping someone buy and sell real estate. I mean, they they confide in you, they trust you, they, you know, any sort of insecurities. Definitely. So yeah, I would so, I'd let the police know for sure. But I kind of like, I don't want to get too involved in this situation. Is that the right thing to do? It's kind of yeah. to inform, but step away. Yep. I think so. Yeah. yeah. I'm always. Um, I did want to let you know of, a, of an interesting case. So some actual litigation that, that's going on. I, I shared this with the board of directors at our last meeting at the UAR. So I wanted to, I've been sharing it with, with other people. It's, it's more of kind of the, the reason why I'm sharing this because oftentimes you as real estate agents, you will negotiate on behalf of your clients via text message, via email, uh, verbally, right? I mean, that makes sense, right? Before you send over an actual offer. So here we became aware of an issue back in April of 2022. So almost a year ago. Um, that could significantly impact all of our membership. And it dealt with a contract, a purported contract being formed um, over a $2.2 million property. So not something insignificant. I mean, this is a high-end property. And here's this, the situation. You had the tenants slash buyer negotiating with one of the owners slash landlord. And they were negotiating over a period of months because the buyer slash tenants wanted to buy the property. And they wanted to deal directly with the, the landlord who happened to be a real estate agent slash realtor as well. 
Um, they had negotiated different terms and they, they finally had a, a kind of a meeting of the mind, so to speak, where they, they felt comfortable moving forward. And the buyer sent one text message and I actually have the text message and so I'll read it verbatim to you. Okay, again, all of this has just been done via text message. The one buyer said, quote, that sounds like you have a deal. Do you want to send me a purchase agreement or shall I have one drawn up? Okay, so that, that, that was the conclusion of the negotiations via text message. Again, sounds like you have a deal. Do you want me to uh, send a purchase agreement or do you want to have one drawn up? Ultimately, the, the seller said, hey, I'll draw it up. I have access to all the forms. A um, couple of days later, after she talked with her husband, who was also on, on title, they decided, no, they, they actually wanted to list the property. They thought they could get closer to $2.6 million rather than 2.2. And so they, they said, no, sorry, we're going to list it. This is what, what it's going to be. Buyer said, well, it looks like we have a contract via text message based on this last text message. Again, the very text message contemplates a signed purchase agreement later coming um, that was never signed, never entered into. And the buyers filed a Liz penance on the property. So they said, hey, we have a legal right to this property. We are going to encumber it. We're going to prevent the sale to any other future buyers. And they did. And think about last year, May, June, July, what happened? I mean, interest rates started to rise. That high end part of the market really started to dry up. Okay. And so now sellers were prevented from selling their property. And so they filed a motion to dismiss. And they also countersued for damages saying, hey, the lien on the property, this Liz pendants is a wrongful lien. And so they, they countered. Um, they also let us know about it because, again, we care because one of the arguments that the buyer was making as to the, the contract was the seller acting in her real estate agent capacity had the authority to sign on behalf of her husband slash client. Now, there was no listing agreement signed. There was no power of attorney signed but just the mere representation in the text messages. And that's what we really cared about. Because again, all of you, I would imagine, have negotiated on behalf of your clients in some fashion via text message or email. So we actually filed a motion, um, the UAR did, filed a motion to appear as amicus curiae. Now that's, I don't know why attorneys use Latin terms and it's just, <laughs> Basically, it's a fancy way of saying we wanted to appear as a friend of the court. That's the Latin definition. Um, and we attached our, our amicus brief and, and the court was able to, re to review it. They, they were apprised that we were aware of it. Now, to file an amicus brief at the district court level before there's been any litigation settled is pretty novel. Um, and frankly, we were expecting that our motion would be dismissed. It was just because it was too premature, but we let the court know that we care about this issue. Um, there are going to be oral arguments next month deciding whether or not the seller's motion to dismiss should or shouldn't be granted. Um, and so what we'll, we're monitoring it, we'll let our members know, you know the outcome of that. But think about it, you have a buyer that has hired an attorney that has filed a lien on the property to enforce a text message contract. Okay, that has zero signatures on it, that has a question on it at the very last text message, should we have a purchase agreement signed? And they're willing to lean the property over that. The only reason I bring this up, I, I think this is going to be settled in, in favor of the sellers. I really do. But for you, and I would imagine you guys are pretty careful, but I would be very mindful of your email and text message communications. I've had a number of calls on the hotline from angry agents where the other side has said something to the effect in writing, oh yeah, my sellers accept, or my sellers will accept, or yeah, my sellers will agree to those terms. They making very definitive statements before they've even checked with their clients. Okay. And, and again, I don't think those are necessarily binding, but I wouldn't want to have to litigate over something like this. We've already found that there's a buyer willing to litigate over this where I think that the case is pretty shaky. 
I would imagine that that there are others that are willing to do that, what? especially against a brokerage. Yeah, avoidable contract or the fact that that there is a contract in in the in the first place. I mean, it, it, yeah, I, I just would be hesitant about trying to to make absolute definitive statements. Is one of their arguments, if I understand, I think I read about this, where their argument that helps justify the signing portion is because the text ended with adding their name, Rob Oki, Pursuit Real Estate. That, con that name gave that signature qualification. Mm -hmm. So therefore that, sure. and with the text message, is what gave that argument that we have a for an actual signed contract. Yeah, the, the listing agent slash one of the owners um, had put on one of her texts, K-A-Z, CAS. Now, again, you guys know, it's kind of real estate 101 that all of the owners have to sign. So even if one of the owners signs and the other one doesn't, you don't have a contract. Like there is pretty strong, significant case law in Utah that just says, doesn't satisfy the statute of frauds. It, there's even a case that talks about how one of the owners purported to have the authority to sign on someone else's behalf when they didn't. And the court said, no, there's not a contract here. Why? Because both owners on title have not signed, which makes sense, right? Um, which kind of segues, wait, you can see I get a little random, but I get excited about things. There is also, I had three calls on Monday about fraudulent land sellers. Have you guys heard about this? Big time going on. Have you guys encountered any of this? Okay. And fraudulent taking homes for rent and listing yes. or vice versa, homes for sale and listing them for rent to collect a deposit. Yeah. Be, be hyper vigilant. It's, you know, with land sales, be hyper vigilant because these, these fraudulent sellers are becoming more and more brazen. What do I mean by that? Well, they're willing to talk to you on the phone. They're willing to, to talk details about their family. They're willing to talk details about the property. They're even willing to give fake identification upon request. They're and they also have a ton of information. They know that you sold the property, you list the property, they give the specifics. They know everything about it when they're divulging it. Right. They've done their they've done their homework. They put a lot of effort and energy into trying to defraud us, which if they just channel that into something positive, I would, I would imagine they'd still be successful. Way back. And she's totally okay on this. And it's a vacant house. I'm just renting it. Yeah. It first and last months in the deposit. And yeah. It, the, the Division of Real Estate issued a press release, I think it's December 8th of last year, and they give some really good tips about that, um, you know, on the buy side and on the sell side. You're going to want to be hyper vigilant, especially if you see a listing where the land looks like it's undervalued and the seller wants to move it quickly. I would be skeptical. We have already seen in Utah, and I don't know the outcome of who ultimately was liable, one closing on, on, the, on these fraudulent, on a fraudulent land sale, where the buyer bought a property from a seller that did not own the property. It actually closed, meaning funds were, were transferred. Um, now, who's liable for that? Is it the title company that had the mobile notary that verified the, I mean, they're still trying to sort that out. Ultimately, I think the buyer will be made whole but someone's going to be left holding the bag, right? And that's that's something that title companies are becoming more and more aware of. Question: Being liable with text messages. Sure. I just had a client text me. What are the housing market predictions for 2023? So, could you be liable for saying your opinion of what's happening in the market? Um, could you? I mean, I have to put everything with the grains. Is it possible? Sure. Is it likely? No, no. I, I think, I mean, unless you're using something that's completely fraudulent, right? Like, yeah, the housing prices are going to go up 20% this year. Well, if you don't have any factual basis to that, then I think that's that's where you could have some liability. I think you would want to point to the basis of your opinion as to why you believe that, that housing is predicted to go in. But certainly there are factors that could um, could influence that. 
And you could have a disclaimer. I mean, that's maybe why people love attorneys. They put disclaimers on the end of different things like this is not legal advice. This is just generally, I mean, I just did a, a, yeah. And, and yeah, I, and I know that that, that sounds dumb, but you know, the one out of a hundred where someone's willing to litigate or, I mean, you'll find it. And frankly, the deeper pockets are the brokerages. I yeah. have a client or someone wanted to buy a house on a weekend and she refused to communicate any other way other than text messaging. Okay. And I took it to everyone in the office and said, how would you interpret this? And everyone interpreted it a different way. <laughs> sure. It scared me to death. She wouldn't talk on the phone. She wouldn't email. Yeah. But everyone had a different opinion of what the text message meant. Sure. Sure. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a fair point. I mean, if, if you're getting different signals as to what her lawful instructions are to you, then that's a problem. And so I would just restate, if you have a question as to what she's actually actually asking you to do, I would restate it. And, and if it's in the form of a text, great, but ideally you would have some sort of, you know, one-on-one -on -one communication with any other form. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Have you ever met that person? Uh -huh. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was gonna, <laughs> sure. Is she out of state? <laughs> yeah. Chat GPT. All about hurt and numbers and texting and just get to the point and bottom line and just go personal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any other questions? I don't want to take up too much time. Any other thoughts or questions I can help you with? You have access to me, you have my hotline number. I do teach at the the class, the boards um, every now and then. So I teach a, almost like a three hour person. I don't know if you wanted to. I, te I teach a class like this where I go over the REPC. Just brace yourself. Just brace yourself. <laughs> okay. okay. Like, if, like you felt invigorated, like you wanted to be a real estate agent after that. That's what you mean. Like I was inspired, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, well, I, I, I would. That that's what I was going for. That's if someone walks out of my class thinking, "Why am I a real estate?" Agent? I've done my my for this. You know? I, I've I've done my job. And I thought, sit up and pay attention. Yeah. Well, that's what I that's what I hope. Um, you know, I I don't say this this casually, but you guys are de facto attorneys. And I, and I treat real estate agents as such. Uh, you have the broadest exception to the unauthorized practice of law in the state of Utah. And I don't think there's a, a close second. You can, you can draft co contracts on behalf of your client. And when I say draft, I, I literally mean that, but with a blank addendum. I've seen creative language. You guys have seen creative language um, that can be interpreted four or five different ways, which is a problem. But just, just be aware of that I want you to, you know, use me as a resource. You guys have fantastic leadership here, so feel free to, to utilize them as well. Number one more time. Sorry, was... 801 676 5211. And I would always recommend you talk to, to your brokers and then um, certainly reach out to me if you have additional questions. Okay, thanks for letting me come over and, and talk to you guys. Appreciate it. <laughs>